This episode of the Memory Palace is brought to you by Amazon Prime's exclusive Lore. It's a chilling six-episode anthology series from executive producer of The Walking Dead and an executive producer of The X-Files based on the podcast phenomenon with over 70 million downloads. Creator and narrator Aaron Mankey explores the most terrifying tales throughout history, takes a myth that is rooted in historical folklore, and twists it, exposing timeless terrors that still haunt us today. Real life can scare you to death. Watch exclusively on Amazon Prime Video this October, starting on Friday the 13th. This episode of the Memory Palace is brought to you by our friends at Article, makers of fine furniture with fantastic industrial and mid-century and Scandinavian designs. Also the makers of the lamp that is lighting this script as I read it. They have everything you need at Article for your home, including brand new, a whole array of fine leather couches. These are really beautiful, extraordinarily well-made, just like everything they've got. And for $49, they will ship anything, including a large, beautiful leather couch to your front door, regardless of size. And you can get $50 off your first order of $100 or more at article.com slash memory palace. That's article.com slash memory palace. This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DeMeo. Anna Jarvis loved her mother. And because she loved her so much, mothers around the world get flowers and cards and candy and hugs from their kids every May, which must have Anna Jarvis spinning in her grave. She was born in 1864 in West Virginia to a woman whose name was also Anna Jarvis. And her mother, Anna Maria, to her daughters Anna Marie, was a remarkable woman. The elder Anna was a feminist and a progressive and a bit of a socialist before any of those words meant anything. In Virginia in the middle of the 19th century, back before the phrase West Virginia meant anything, she traveled throughout Appalachia, organizing women's groups, teaching them about basic health and how to demand workers' rights after teaching them what those rights were in the first place. During the Civil War, she brought women together to tend to sick and wounded soldiers, regardless of whether they wore blue or gray. After the war, with her baby Anna in her arms, she held meetings of mothers on both sides in these proto-group therapy sessions of finding closure through shared grieving kind of thing. And she promoted something called Mother's Work Day. This wasn't mother apostrophe S, So not your mother, but mothers, as apostrophe, mothers plural, a collective of mothers. It was a radical idea. Let's take a day, and it would be a day of demonstrations and political consciousness raising, not of flowers or spa gift certificates. Let's take a day and recognize that what mothers do is work. And let's organize those workers the same way that people were starting to do at mines and mills and factories. This was the work of her life. And when she died in 1905, her life became the work of her daughter's life. Anna Marie, the younger Jarvis, was 29 years old and single, with no child of her own. She was devastated by her mother's death, and at her funeral she handed out hundreds of carnations, one to each of the mothers in the congregation. She had picked up the torch of her own mother's cause, and wouldn't put it down for the rest of her life. She delivered speeches, she published pamphlets, She worked to governors and newspaper editors, senators, mayors, anyone in power, all in a campaign to get the government to recognize Mother's Day. And she succeeded and failed at the same time. People love the idea of a Mother's Day because people love their mothers. And importantly, people love the story of Anna Jarvis loving her own mother. It was a national holiday by 1914, and Jarvis kept going, talking about her mother and Mother's Day all over the world. And for people all over the world, maybe wondering why they'd grown apart from their own mothers, maybe wishing their own children would thank them once in a while. For people all over the world, Anna Jarvis became the platonic ideal of the devoted daughter, and they wrote to her. So many wrote to her to thank her, to unload about their mother-child relationships, that she had to buy a second house next door in which to store a correspondence. Mother's Day would roll around every year, and Anna Jarvis, a woman with no child of her own, would get flowers by the score, heart-shaped boxes of candy by the carload, which made Anna Jarvis furious. The holiday, designed to continue her mother's lifetime of effort working towards social justice and collective action, had gone commercial. Anna had thanked her mother by devoting her life to building a kind of living memorial, and it felt like all she'd accomplished was making it easy for people to go and thank theirs with a prepackaged sentiment and a penny greeting card. 
And so she railed against it for the rest of her life, spending all of her modest savings on campaigns against the commercialization of Mother's Day, filing lawsuits to stop Mother's Day celebrations, condemning confectioners, fighting florists. But the candy kept coming, and the flowers didn't stop. And when she died, penniless and blind, in a state sanatorium in Pennsylvania in 1948, her room was filled with Mother's Day cards.